Welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. Here's your host, Tom Bourne. Hi, and welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. I'm your host, Tom Bourne, and with me today is the absolutely awesome Bob Edwards. Bob, how are you? Well, I'm doing good. It's uh, it's the middle of the afternoon for me, so probably a little more rested than you are at the moment. The middle of the night for you, but yes, yeah, great to be on the call with you. Any, anything to have quality people on the pod, I can tell you now. Uh, Bob, you mentioned in the same sentences as Sidney Decker, Todd Conklin, uh, you're the, an author, you're a human organizational performance advocate practitioner, you teach leadership. Uh, where did it all start for you? Well, so I was I was working in GE. I, I was in their appliance division, and I was there for about 16 years. And in around 2012, 2013-ish, uh, GE, Chevron, and Alcoa kind of partnered up and started, you know, talking with folks like Tony Mashara and Todd Conklin and started realizing that there might be some different ways to look at safety. And um, so GE... We're always known for kind of being an early adopter. We didn't get everything right in GE, but we did a lot of things good. But um, they they said, hey, we'll see if we have some sites interested. And so we were actually one of the first sites we threw our hand up and said, hey, this sounds interesting. It sounds different than what we've been doing. And uh, so that's how I met Todd Conklin, I think, in early 2013. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. It's, it's, that's, and it's all history from that point on, right? I mean, that's where it got started. And then in our world of, of operations, we're manufacturing people. I was a maintenance manager who became a safety manager, engineer by trade. Uh, and so we just started really creating this, this operational learning piece. The learning team is where it started. And then now it's just grown into, hey, how do we get better operational learning? This kind of been the thing that has been a big part of what I've done is to help just because I'm an old maintenance manager, right? I mean, it's got to be something I can do with this now. It's really good thought processes now what can we do so it's kind of combining lots of different things together from all all of our experiences from even stuff from lean and from dr dimming and of course all the newer thinkers you know conklin and decker and love holland stuff and edgar shine so we just started looking at all this stuff and saying hey what all makes sense and let's pull it together and th that the name actually is you know it's human and organizational performance so it's not the human or the organ it's, it's this combination. So, yeah, so I got involved with it, love it. And then uh, and then 2015, Tom, I, I left GE to go out here and to do this, you know, independently. And so we have a little consortium with Andy Baker, Todd Conklin, myself, Mark Yeston, Martha Costa, you know, a group of us that just kind of little think tankish kind of thing, right? We share a lot of, of, of ideas and information. We're all independent, but we all help each other out and you know, try to get the right person in there to help out if an organization needs some help or, or wants our help. So, yeah, it's kind of, it's been really exciting and it's, and it, it, it doesn't cease to be exciting. I still love doing this. Yeah. Um, great loss for industry and also thought, thought leaders in general, Edward Sean passing away. Oh, no, what a great man. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, humble inquiry. Who would have thought that would actually uh, catch on uh, as opposed to, some of the old style leadership where we uh, set ourselves apart from people and, and tend yeah. to talk down at them. Um, and, the old and, and, very Tayloristic, right, Tom? The, the, old, the old manager is smarter than the worker, all that old stuff is going to waste. Yeah, as, sure? assuming, at the old school of assuming that we know better than people. I just yeah, yeah. I shake my head at that stuff. I can tell you now, one of the first things I try and instill into my students is you know better than anyone else. You may have a bit more education, you may have a bit more life experience than people, but we're all the same. We're all here doing a job. Right. All right. Uh, did engineering hold you in good stead in the work you're doing now, being able to actually look at processes and analyze them and, and, and see where improvements could be made? Yeah, I mean, Todd told me that early on, too. You know, I was working with him inside GE. He was helping GE get this started. And, um, you know, he saw my my sort of leaning towards solving problems in engineering and Kaizen and all my lean stuff. And so he said, you know, he, he saw pretty early that that learning, the learning team approach was a really good way to get traction with this. And for me, it's great because it brings together all this stuff. It's like systems engineering stuff. It's like the human psychology piece of it. It's like 
you know, talking about resilience and reliability, we need both. Um, so yeah, and and from an engineering point of view, and I and I I know this because a lot of times we get sort of tagged as very linear thinkers, and to some degree, I I think that's probably true. A lot of engineers we are, but when we understand complexity better, which is what has helped me, Tom, the more I learn about complexity and complex adaptive systems, that in and of itself is a science, right? Complexity science, and so the engineering mind can sort of wrap its brain around that as well and embrace that. So. Um, yeah, the engineering has served me really well. And then also looking at systems and saying, you look at the human in that system and you look at the system and how brittle it is. And the more we do this operational learning stuff, the more we realize, man, it's the adaptive nature of humans that's making us so successful. We don't have perfect processes or perfect procedures and we don't have perfect people, but we have very adaptive people. So yeah, it's been quite a journey for me. And, and I think the engineering has helped me a lot. Excellent. All right. Most people in safety uh, related fields that I talk to uh, have developed over time uh, a suitable dose of cynicism uh, and frustration in the work that they do and what's expect or what they feel is expected of them. Um, How can, firstly, can you understand that? And the second part is, can you help them? Well, so first of all, Tom, I had the privilege. Now, I am not a trained safety professional. I am a mechanical engineer. I did take advanced safety engineering management from UAB, so I have some some training in that. But I worked in safety because GE was good about this. Like I worked at the same site for 16 years, but the last, before I became this hop advocate, for the last five years prior to that, I would actually got to work in safety. I had no idea how much safety people have to know. It's unbelievable. Just uh, everything from the compliance stuff to the JSAs to the pre-inspections to the, it just goes on and on. So it was a fascinating time for me. I have a great appreciation for safety professionals. And um, and, and I think that that it is frustrating because you, you do all these things and bad things still happen. So what has helped me with this is when we start to realize that, that you know, in complex adaptive systems, you can't predict everything, which means you can't prevent everything. And you start to wrap your brain around Around that, then we start to say, okay, that means we need to have not just all these prevention conversations, we got to have a lot more conversations about not what if, but when, right? The mitigation side of this. And so I think safety professionals, uh, for, for to a large degree, I think it's a bit of a breath of fresh air. Like, wow, this is some new, maybe some new thinking about the mitigation side of this. So I encourage, like, I, I love for safety people to get involved in this because this fits nicely into safety. It also fits nicely into just operational upsets and quality issues and efficiency improvements. I mean, human and organizational performance is is a very holistic look at how work is done. Yeah, excellent. Uh, looking at your bio, it says you've over you led over 200 learning teams. That's a long time ago, Tom. That's yeah. a long time ago. I have no idea how many I've led. I lead them every week, just about it. <laughs> All but, right. Um, for those who don't, for those who haven't heard of learning teams, what do they do, and uh, what what can they expect if they uh, got you in to help them with learning teams? So the, the whole the, the reason that and actually Andy Baker and I both in our different divisions of GE, she worked in aviation and I was working in appliances, um, and then we started working together when we met each other. And, and Todd and 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 Andy and I actually did some work together, the three of us back in the day. And we realized in our world that our investigations, uh, to be nice about it, were um, were painful at best. Like they were, mm. to be honest, really, they're kind of geared almost like an interrogation, like separating people out and getting eyewitness statements and trying to figure out who was telling the truth and who wasn't. And anyway, so we, we thought, man, that might be a good place to start, to try to change. And so we started thinking about what, what if we looked at like all the conditions, not just the the fact that somebody pushed the wrong button. So the learning team backs away from the event. The event just shows me there's some kind of problem. It could be a safety event, it could be a near miss, it could be a quality escape, but it just says, hey, there's brittleness here. So what we do with learning teams is instead of separating people out, we bring people together. The people closest to the work, the masters of the work, if you will, the masters of the blue line, as we call it, with the black line, blue line, sense-making model. Mm -hmm. And you bring them together to teach you so the, the learning team is the organization learning from the people who actually do the work. 
and they're brilliant and they know this stuff. They know the ins and the outs, you know, the nuances. And when they don't, when they have a, we call it psychological safety, but I'm an old maintenance guy. So to me, that means it's a safe place to talk. Mm -hmm. Tom, I can tell you Mm -hmm. the truth without fear of retribution. So if you want to know the truth, I can tell you the truth, but I'm not going to tell you the truth if I think you're going to write me up or fire me, right? Mm, True. So it builds an environment where people can be, can be comfortable telling the truth. And then they teach us about their work. And if you take some time to learn really first and foremost, like how does normal work happen? You start to realize it, the event becomes kind of obvious. So it's collaborative. It brings people together. It's restorative. I mean, you know, Decker talks a lot about restoration. It's mm-hmm. restorative in nature because let's say I did mess up. Tom, let's say I did push the wrong button and it caused harm or caused damage or caused, you know, financial loss or whatever. But I didn't do it on purpose. Mm. If I did it on purpose, then I'm a terrorist. Fire me. Right. But I didn't do it on purpose. I was just trying to get work done and, and I messed up. Now, if I can tell you about those work conditions in a safe place, and you know I didn't do this on purpose, you set punishment aside. That doesn't belong here. Punishing doesn't build more accountability. Punishment drives people to not talk. That's true. And so it, you, you bring people together to learn from them, and then they get to help you make it better. That's the restorative piece, too. I get to talk about it. I get to share what was going on, and but then I also get to help make it better. So it makes the it, it's restorative for the organization, but also restorative for the person that may have gone through this. So that's why I love this. It's a very different approach than any sort of. I mean, yeah, and I've done a lot of like continuous improvement, Kaizen events and things, and those are all they're a lot of fun too. That they're often sort of centered up on efficiency improvements. This approach you can couple it with your Kaizen, with your continuous CI work, your continuous improvement work, um, but it's it's just much more holistic. It, it looks at the complex nature of the work, not just where the inefficiencies are. Yeah, yeah. Does that help a little bit? No. <laughs> I, that, talk that, 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 yeah. I talk about learning teams all day long. I love them. They're always inter, in, they're always energizing. They're always informative. They're always collaborative. And and here's how I know it's working because I just did uh, did a learning team this week at a site. And at the end of each of the sessions, they're not very long. Each learning team session for me is about an hour, hour and a half long at the most. Uh, everybody's still talking like they're, they, they're we're, we're dismissed. We'll see you guys tomorrow. We'll give them some soak time overnight. Right. We have a little process that we built into this and they're all still, they get up and they're still talking. They're still sharing. If it was an investigation, they're gone. Yeah. Right. As soon as you're done, they're out of there. So it's a very different feel to it. Completely different feel. And I know it's working when people say, Hey, when, when do I get to be on a learning team? Yeah. Like in my entire history, prior military and all my history and industry, Tom, nobody has ever said, Bob, when are you going to come investigate me? Like, <laughs> nobody wants to be investigated. No. So yeah, that was that's a that's a big sort of difference between um, the investigation approach and the operational learning or the learning team approach. Does that help? Oh, absolutely. Um, safety has some very strong terms about an investigation, safety officers, etc. <sighs> If we just change the language we use, and I'll, I'll throw in there root cause as another one of those problematic terms, um, do you think that we might actually, I don't know, achieve a great understanding with management from middle management and a higher about what safety actually is? Well, yeah, so I, I mean, changing the, change the terminology is very important because words are powerful, right? Words mm-hmm. I mean, words start wars for crying out loud, right? They lead to divorces. I mean, words, <laughs> words are powerful. So words are very important, uh, but also belief systems are really important. Yep. So if, if my foundational belief is, is that people come to work to do a good job, even that grouchy old guy, Tom, that says, I hate it here. Oh, you've been here 30 years. You know, those guys, mm-hmm. they don't really hate it here. They may have not felt heard, or they may just like to complain a lot, but they actually come to work to do a good job. So a fundamental belief that I have is that most people actually come to work to do a good job. Yeah. And very, very seldom do people come to work to deliberately cause harm. Those are terrorists, right? Those are people we want out of our organization. So if most people come to work to do a good job, then somebody does mess up, punishing them is not going to fix anything. Mm. Blaming them is not even fixing anything. To me, blame is like a distraction. It's almost, it's almost like saying, we got a system problem here, but it's much easier just to blame the person. So mm-hmm. let's stop blaming so much. And we don't say, well, no blame ever. I mean, I mean, humans blame. We blame ourselves. We blame each other. We just say, don't, don't get hung up there because it's a waste of energy. Yeah. Right. 
it, and, it, and it really does the heavier the blame environment is it really shuts people down like people aren't going to tell you the real deal that's true um does that would that suggest that one of the key components in any successful safety uh, process is actually building trust and rapport with your people? Wow, that's really so. Rapport and trust, two very different things. Um, like trust, Tom, there's probably five people on planet Earth that I trust, and none of those are businesses, right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm just being honest, right? Business is business. They're going to, I mean, I, to be honest, GE sold my entire division, right? They sold all of GE appliances. So I don't, like, I don't trust GE, but I trust people. Mm. But I think you're onto something with sort of how we interact with each other. And if we can build an environment where people can tell the truth without fear of retribution, which I guess you're, I mean, to a point, it, that is part of trust. But trust to me is very personal. It's It can be fragile, right? It can be hard to gain and easy to lose. And I don't really trust businesses. I'm not opposed to talking about building more trust in the workplace. It's just, it's the workplace. If mm. times get tough, they lay us all off. True. I mean, that's just the way this goes, right? But yeah. I can build an environment in there where it's okay to, oh, there's a guy, I can't think of his name. He's a he's a, a ranger, park ranger, and he has a really cool uh, little saying. He says, we have to build the capacity for candor. Mm. Like, so we can be open and honest, not rude and mean, just open and honest. What does this really look like? So that's what I, that's kind of how I look at it. And that, that is getting to know each other and, and getting to so, you know, believing that I can tell you this truth without, you know, you write me up, fire me, or, or almost as bad, blacklisting me, where, like, I never get promoted again or whatever, right? That's also bad to form a punishment. Uh, you, you would have done quite a few investigations over the years with your background. Um, trying to explain to people why, after an event, groups of people may collude to get a story straight. And I've, I've tried to nut it down over the years to make it as simple as possible. And, and to me, uh, it comes down to simply they're afraid. They're afraid of something, whether it's afraid for themselves or afraid for someone else or afraid. But there's a fear factor which makes them want to, you know, get a story a particular way. Is, am I am I missing something or is that, is that sort of on the money? Yeah, no, that's exactly right, especially in investigations, because they're worried about a lot of investigations lead to people getting fired, getting written up, final written warning, you know, get sent through anger management class or whatever. Right. And so all that's punitive and feels negative. And so we try to get our story straight in a learning team. You're not looking for one true story. You just want everybody's kind of story of how they do their work. And it's really cool because, I mean, the one I led this week. Literally, the guys that are planning this isolation process and the ones that execute it, there was so much that they didn't even know about each other's work. They were learning from each other. Like, they, I had no idea you had to do all that before I could do my work. And so it's it's much more about building an environment where people teach us how they do their work. Like, what does normal work look like? And so we're not looking for, um, like, an exact story because there is no exact story. There's everybody's story. So it's a very it's a very different approach. I don't have a problem with people trying to collude because I'm not going in there trying to get a story. I want everybody's story. Yep. What does it take? How do you operate that? How'd you get good at that? What's it look like in the morning when you guys kick off? How's that intersection go throughout the day? Whatever it is, right? And I don't have like a, with learning teams, no list of questions. It's just curiosity. It's uh, you know it's back to that humble inquiry. Edgar Schein writes so much, wrote so much about. Uh, and and so a lot of the terms that he uses are very, very true and technical terms. And a lot of times I'll just like give a an old maintenance spin on it, right? Mm -hmm. But humble inquiry really is it's about it's about curiosity and being teachable. Yes. Yes. Because yes. you might you can look up and research humble inquiry that you should, we all should, right? But then a practical term for me is uh, yeah, let's be teachable. Let's not think we already know, even if I used to do that job, I didn't do it today, so I don't really know what it's like out there good point all right um in the last few years uh safety professionals may have had light bulb moments and uh somehow they've listened to or heard about safety to new safety and all of a sudden it's crystallized what they've thought in the back of their mind but felt like they were the isolated person who um, was thinking this strange stuff by himself why do you think it's taken so long for our thinking 
to move from you know behaviorist models into into sort of um, an, a, a I would suggest a better way of thinking about things. Because I think it took us a long time to get there. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think for decades, if not centuries, of bad action led to a bad outcome must be a bad person, right? Yeah. It goes yeah. way, way back in our history. So I think, Tom, we're really fighting against, I mean, who knows? If, if there's probably some part of our DNA that says blame, right? There's a little strand in there that's got a finger pointing at somebody else. Um, so I, I think that's why. I think we just had, yeah, we know through the from the Industrial Revolution on, right? The work that was done in the early part of the Industrial Revolution where they literally said, the manager, the, the first person who does this work doesn't have the mental capacity that the manager has. Yes. I mean, that's right from Frederick Taylor's work, right? So we have all this sort of embedded in how we've been operating, us versus them. And so I think it's going to take a while. But but it is happening. That's what's exciting. If it, you know, we're almost 10 years into sort of this hop movement, if you will. Mm-hmm. And it's like it's, it's, it just keeps spreading. It just keeps growing. And, and then their places will go a bit and slide back a bit. And then they'll get some other manager in with the old school oh, ways yeah. and it'll, he'll damp it down and tap it down. And then they have, you know, so it's, I don't think it's going to change quickly, but I think it is changing. Yeah. I, yeah. I, don't, I think we're having conversations now that we could not have had 30 years ago oh, absolutely. in industry. Yeah. I'll, but I'll, it's, I'll, you're right. It's slow. It's, you have to be patient and, um, you know, take small steps, and I, I'm a big believer in those those small adjustable steps that you can take to to start to make make it different. Yeah, I'm I'm hearing from um, some parts of industry that old inverted commas old style thinkings. If you're a manager with old style thinkings, you no longer have a job in some of these places. So it's a bit scary for some of those people who can't let go of those uh, ideals, I guess, or beliefs. Yeah. yeah. Um. One of the other things that I find scary was with the, I saw a poll the other day on LinkedIn. I don't know if you're how you feel about this, but yeah, this whole nonsense that we seem to see about you are the person who is responsible entirely for your own safety. <laughs> we there was a poll put out by someone who's actually uh, you know, fairly prominent, and it was who is responsible for your own safety at the workplace, and even in 2023. And there was a lot of people who voted in this. There was 61% of the people who said, you are responsible for your own safety. And I was like, we've obviously got a long way to go yet because I wouldn't have never dreamt that was going to be like that. But fair enough, right, Tom? How long have we said that? How many mirrors have you looked at in factories uh-huh. that has a sticker up there that says you're looking at the person who's responsible for your safety, right? Mm. And how many T-shirts do we have? Some of us probably have tattoos that say <laughs> I am responsible for my own safety, right? Yep. So once again, it is a long, long history of sort of programming this way. And and that's so that I think it's going to take a while for that to change too. Yeah. I, 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 lo- I love the training that gets the worker to, to focus more on their work and be more attentive. And you go, what do you think they were doing beforehand? You know, yeah. I've just come into work with their eyes shut uh, or – you know, if you love your family, you will oh, be no, extra right. safe. I'm like, oh, well, what are you saying? Anyone who's had an incident doesn't love, don't their, love family? their family. <laughs> <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Yeah. All right. Um, in your opinion, safety professionals, what should they be focusing on? Oh, I just I think anything they can read and learn and, and sort of practice in this space, give it a go, even if it feels a little uncomfortable, because maybe like some people have been really steeped in sort of compliance nothing wrong we need to be compliant but we also know that that compliance isn't enough right it doesn't get us there so i'd say i say read anything you're willing to read listen to podcasts listen to people talk about stuff don't believe anything yeah. <laughs> they, like kick that front brain front of lobe in like hardcore and just analyze and think about everything including all the stuff you've been taught i question everything tom and and I love to learn from other people, but I don't think that somebody I don't I don't think anybody has the answer here. I think there's lots of people thinking in the right direction, and we just keep sharing our ideas. That's what's cool about this too, Tom, is that there's not a there's not somebody who owns this. This is a 
uh, almost like an industrial reformation. It's not an industrial revolution. We've been through several of those uh, and we'll go through more of those. Right now it's what, industry 4.0, right? Automation, AI, all that stuff. But but there's a, a, a reformation that's happening from this sort of thing. It's reforming the way we think about a lot of this stuff. So I just encourage people, safety professionals or not, um, you know, I mean, re, re, and Reed Decker and Conklin and Hallnagel and Edgar Schein and, you know, thinking fast and thinking slow. And I mean, there's so much good stuff out there that it doesn't have to all be safety related. Anything that can help you with uh, deeper understanding of complexity and complex adaptive systems. And some of that stuff's really heady. I mean, I've written, written, I've written, I've read some th things that Holland wrote and that it's really good, but it takes me like, I go one or two pages and I have to go back and go over those one or two pages to see if I understood it. But I just take that and apply it to the work world, which I'm very familiar with. So, you know, some of this stuff's very academic, but that's good. We need the people in the academic realm to be thinking in that space and we need to then take it and, and you know, try to make it practical. I mean, when, 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 um, when Sidney Decker like takes an intersection and they take all the signs away, right? There's no, there's no reason for that experiment. Mm -hmm. And it, it may seem like extreme, but if there's a reason for it, because we actually have the opposite at most intersections, so much stuff you can't tell what's what, right? And so the, the point is well taken that, okay, we've done too much that direction. So we need to center back up or find something that actually is helpful. Mm -hmm. so I, lo I love the thinking. I, I love the way that these guys push our, push us to think differently. And you don't have to believe everything any of us say. Just at least listen. That's right. That's right. All right. Um, what else can I say? All right. Uh, just a question for you. In Australia, we seem to be heading down a pathway where we're a bit more reactive to incidents and accidents. And regulators, legislators seem to be layering on greater and greater uh, penalties or harsher penalties if you uh, are found to be breaching safety laws. In your opinion, does making safety uh, laws, making penalties for breaking safety laws harsher, do that, does that actually affect safety in the workplace at all? Oh, yeah, it affects it a lot. <laughs> I'm not talking. If I, if I think I'm going to get in trouble, you're not going to hear anything from me. So I think it affects it. Does it make it better? Mm, maybe not. Yeah. Right? I, I think open, being open and honest is, is going to be really important. I need to be able to really tell you the truth about how this work goes. Mm -hmm. And if I'm afraid I could get written up or fined, like mm -hmm. you're going to take money away from me, they already take enough money away with taxation. So now you want to take money away from me because I did something wrong in this workplace, you're not going to hear anything from me, which means <laughs> then we're not fixing stuff. So yeah. that's, that's from a very sort of practical, I I don't think it's the right path. I, you know, you can ask yourself there, is it helping or is it, you know, is is it shutting people down? Because if we're not listening and learning to the operators and workers or in, in the leaders and managers too, listening to each other, then, um, then we're not going to be fixing the correct things because nobody's talking about it. Yeah. So I, I don't think, I'll say this, and 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 I I actually would challenge anybody to prove me wrong because if you if you can prove me wrong it's fine to us talk about it but I have yet to see any organization any anything anywhere where they have punished their way to operational excellence mm -hmm. not even the U.S. Marine Corps and yeah. I'm a whole army guy but I've got a son <laughs> in the Marine and the Marines they have a little slogan that says to err is human to forgive is divine and neither are Marine Corps policy well that's their little fun slogan that looks cool in a tattoo. But the reality is, in their warfighting manual, it says we cannot have a zero tolerance mentality with Marines in the field because they will make mistakes. There's just too, it's too complex. There's too much stuff going on. We cannot have a zero tolerance with them. Mm -hmm. So even the U.S. Marine, arguably one of the most elite fighting forces on planet Earth, also did not punish their way to operational excellence. So mm -hmm. nobody has. Why do we think pouring more punishment is going to somehow work this time? It's not. Good, good. All right. If, in your opinion, is there any useful uh, way of measuring safety in the workplace? Wow, that's a that's a really – so measuring safety in the workplace. I think there's ways to measure capacity and, and sort of what do we have in place if not if this happens, but when this happens, it, you know, will it recover or can we save it, can we stop it? And how strong are those prevention – devices that we have, right? 
And yeah. how much are we relying on paperwork? There are ways to look at this, but mm -hmm. it takes a lot more context. Tom, I'm really leery of metrics, yep. um, especially metrics without context. Yes, I see this happen a lot where I've got my dashboard's all green. Good job, Bob. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? There's no context for that. It's just a bunch of green smiley faces or everything's in green numbers or whatever. And so, and I'm an old GE guy. We measured everything. But, you know, what gets measured gets done, all those things. But I say this, I say metrics for any part of our organization, safety, quality, production, metrics without context is dangerous. Yeah. I think it can be deadly. So we can absolutely have everything in the green and we can have a horrific events happen because we don't know the context behind that. And uh, David Payne, who's retired now from um, from Chevron, he was their senior VP of eh and &S. He used yep. to say this. He used to say, don't tell me about how good our numbers are. He says, tell me where the brittleness is. Tell me what should be keeping me up at night. And he was a leader, a fierce leader. If you've ever met him, he's just an amazing guy. Um, and when he got a hold of this way of thinking, he really applied it in in his world of leading EHS for a first for Chevron, a really big company that's that's done a ton of this hop stuff. Yeah. So yeah, so I think metrics and safety, same thing. I, I know we have to measure like recordable rates and stuff for our re regulators. We just de-emphasize that. Um, and we saw this happen at my site when we became more and more open and honest. It's it's a fact. Our our injury rates went up, but our severity rates went down, and yes. our workers comp. Yeah, our workers' comp in a two-year period dropped to like the lowest we'd ever seen because, Tom, they're bringing it forward. Yeah. So we were less worried about is it a recordable and more worried about is could this have been bad or was it bad? Can we do something here so it's less likely to happen in the future? So I don't know if that helps or not, but metrics, I could talk all day about metrics. And I have a million examples, not a million. I got a hundred examples of yeah. where, where metrics appeared to be good and – we thought it was the best production day ever, and we nearly were blowing something up out there because we were running it so hard, right? Yeah. The numbers uh, look great. Oh, look, I, I, I think safety metrics, basically, uh, I'm a bit like in the Greg Smith camper where I say that they um, they measure activity. They don't measure safety yeah. at all. Uh, and if you're measuring activity, well, haven't we just created an extra process for the sake of creating a process to reassure someone, I don't know, high up the food chain so they can sleep at night. Um, yeah, I don't think it actually relates anything to what actually happens down in the coal fire. So but we need to talk about it more, don't we, Tom? We need to we need to challenge metrics more. We need to say, okay, what what how did we go from green to red? What happened? Did we just work the numbers enough that we got there, or do we actually excuse oh, me, do yeah. we actually change something to make it better? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you're right. I, there's some evidence that the higher the rate of reported injuries and incidents, the, the lower the chance of fatalities and serious injuries actually right, happening right. because because we're actually reporting the things we should have been reporting and they're being addressed before they're catastrophic. Yeah, no, it's kind of the opposite of the old triangle thing we used to say, right? Oh, Give it a yeah. Things the big things won't happen. In reality, report all those, report everything you can, talk about everything you can, work on making things better, and you reduce the likelihood. Uh, there's a, what, Holland said something pretty cool in his work around complexity. He said that the ability to steer your organization away from some catastrophic failure, the ability to do that well is, is your ability to learn, like learn what is happening. And Andy and, and Todd Conklin and Andy Baker and Todd both say it's the speed with which we learn. It's the speed with which we learn what is happening, not just what has happened. So that means we do have to, you mentioned earlier about kind of like, do we even know our people, right? Do we know our people? Do we know our processes? Are we close enough to them that they can really tell us? Because, you know, somebody close to the work, how many times has something happened? You've had this happen probably before where you're talking to them and they're like, yeah, I kind of knew this was going to happen. Mm, yeah, like, they're so close to it they can feel it they can sense it they can smell it because they have so much sort of just local knowledge about what it takes yep. to, to for that process they know when something's slightly off yeah all right i think we gotta get better at that we gotta get better at listening to people close to the work and seeking out that information too not just hey i've got an open door policy but we gotta get out of our stinking meetings and off of our email and get out there close to operations and get to know people yeah i'm 100 percent with that I don't know how many times I've seen leaders who have open door policies, but the door's always shut. They're always in meetings and they've got five <laughs> minutes here and there. And can you send me an email request? And you go, yeah. no worker's going to do that. 
No one's going to no. come and tell you. And unless you're act- actually actively asking them, yep. they're not going to volunteer information because, yeah. All right. Uh, you're coming to our beautiful country soon in March. Uh, yes. Stopping in Brisbane and Perth. Okay. What are you here for? Uh, so Southpac has brought me over there a bunch to do workshops. And I love working with them. They they said, I, I just kind of show up, Tom. They they just like, shove me in a room and say, go, Bob. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's they, they set it all up. It's just a, a lot of fun. I think we're doing uh, probably uh, fundamentals and learning teams. That's kind of a, a traditional thing we do a lot of um, just to get more and more people, you know, up to speed on this and, and better at it. And, yeah. Okay. So I'm looking forward to it. And I'm also looking forward to a good flat white coffee because, you know, I just can't find one here in the States. So I've got my Australian coffee mug here, but I don't have a good flat white in it. That's just plain old coffee there. Oh, we do like our coffee. Um, not that not that stuff from Starbucks, mate, I can tell you. <laughs> no, you guys uh, have good coffee. Now, Bob, I'm going to challenge you here. I pretend I'm an overburdened business owner. I'm mm-hmm. a manager who's always believed that if workers just did their job the way I've told them to do it, followed the damn procedures that we put in place, uh, they wouldn't become hurt or they wouldn't, you know, impact on my bottom line. Why should I change my thinking? Well, because people are still getting hurt and you're you're stressing that they should, uh, should care more and think more is not fixing it. So there's something else missing there is what I'd say. And so... First of all, we, we I, like I personally work with, I don't even know, 130 plus different companies. Nobody has perfect procedures, nobody. <laughs> and nobody has all-inclusive procedures because you can't. Yep. And it would be a waste of time to try. And so all of the sort of variability out there, you can't capture all that in a procedure or in a startup procedure or in a standard work. Nothing can capture all that. And people are out there dealing with it all the time. And when you really take time to learn, from the people who do the work and look at their procedures and the process and the process is falling apart. It's the law of entropy, right? Yeah. I'm an old maintenance manager. All we did was fight against the law of entropy, right? Things go from order to disorder. The procedures are never perfect and they cannot capture the variability and they never keep up with the change that's happening. And then humans are not perfect, right? We make mistakes. There's human error involved, but yeah. humans are incredibly adaptive, like sort of brilliantly resilient. We're just not very reliable. And so that's why are we expecting a human to always be reliable? That's not even the human condition. We are incredibly adaptive. We adapt in the moment. When you drive, you're adapting in the split second and don't even realize it. And they're resilient. Aussies are resilient, right? So are a lot of most Americans. Something bad happens. You guys have had some tough times. You just get right back up, dig yourself out of the hole and get back into motion. Humans are incredibly resilient. But we're somehow expecting them to be like perfectly reliable with a process that's not complete. You know, procedures are incomplete. Processes are broken or breaking. And we expect them to somehow the, to perfectly follow some rule that doesn't even always make sense. So, yeah. So part of it is, is just bringing all that information together and saying, hey, manager, <laughs> this is what it actually looks like to do this work. Mm-hmm. And oh, by the way, when you look at how the work actually gets done, the procedure, I'd say if it's a really, really good procedure, it, it might cover 10% of that. Yeah. In most cases, it's 2%. And the rest of it is all human sort of experience, adaptation, you know, capacity. The, the, the human is actually making this work successful more than anything else. So that, that's what I would say. I would say it, it's, it's worth looking at. And I know you're busy as a manager, Tom, and I know you don't have time for this, but I don't think you have time to not do this. I think it's so important because, because trying to get people to follow procedures perfectly is not, it's not going to get us there. Yeah. I mean, it's not getting us there, right? And our procedures can't capture all the variability. And sometimes, Tom, I've seen this. We may have put some defense in place, and then later we're like, well, hey, they're not even using that anymore. It's a failure of sustainability. Well, that might be, but it also might be a failure of safeguard evolution. Like the work may have changed, mm. and the safeguard still something over here, we're looking at it and going, well, that doesn't even make any sense anymore. So sometimes we would get frustrated with people saying, we told you to do it this way. And they're saying, yeah, but the work now looks like this. And that no no longer even fits. So it may be a sustainability problem, but it oftentimes is a sort of failure of safeguard evolution. It didn't change as the work did. So any of that, I can help a manager see the real deal. 
uh, but they got to be willing to, right? Yeah. If they're not interested in the real story, then you know you can't really do this new view or we call it HOP, human and organizational performance, or safety two, safety differently. You can't really do these if you don't have leadership on board, because yeah. they can shut it down pretty quick if they if you do a really good operational learning and then they punish somebody, they're done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, people aren't going to do that again. It's it, it's it's impossible to make someone want to learn. They actually have to need to do it by themselves. Uh, one of the great things I've, I've one of my guests actually said that if workers don't actually understand the process of procedures and what they actually mean, they go like this: uh, piece of paper. Is that going to protect yeah. you? And it's not. It's not. They yeah. actually have to have a fundamental understanding of how that's come in place and what it's actually designed to do rather than just signing on that they will follow a procedure. Yeah, exactly. And, right. and Tom, you know, it happened, it happened when in the, I, I kind of consider the third significant industrial revolution was when we started introducing computers. There's procedures written for everything. We had all this, we are zero, goal zero stuff. All these things came through for, I don't know, about 20 years. It just began to kind of build and build and build. And I think we believed that if you had good procedures, anybody could do the job. That's not true. No. Right. No. And and now we've seen that with COVID and the loss of a lot of workers leaving the workplace, like no. going to other jobs or leaving it all together. They call it in the US, they call it the great resignation. Mm. We're losing these some of these really experienced workers. We are having a really hard time running these processes because the procedure and a new person doesn't get it done. Yeah. Because the procedure was never adequate enough. We actually still were relying heavily on the adaptive humans in the system and the experienced humans in the system, but somehow we kind of fooled ourselves into thinking, well, it's because we got all these great procedures. Yeah. Anybody that's watching this, don't think I'm against or listen. Is this watched and listened to? Is it video and audio or both? Both. Or both. Yeah, okay. So yeah, please don't think that I hate procedures. Actually, I don't dislike procedures. They're just not adequate. They, yeah. they don't capture everything you need to know. And if you can't change them easily, they're probably outdated already. Yeah, true. All right, Bob, we've got time for one last question. Uh, in your home country of the US, is progress being made in safety? Are we actually starting to see a decline in deaths across the countryside or, and serious injuries declining? Well, all the companies that we work with that, that are using this different way of looking at stuff, they're changing what they're fixing. And they're not fixated on a bug bite that became recordable there are a lot more, and I don't want somebody to get hurt by a bug. It's just, that's not really, mm. I, don't, I don't stay awake at night thinking about that, right? So more and more companies are actually listening to the workers. The workers are helping them come up with ways to make this work safer. And I say this all the time, Tom, work's not safe. No. Work is inherently dangerous. Everything inside a pipe wants out. Electricity is always looking for a ground. It could be you or me. Everything on that cabinet wants my head and everything on the ground is trying to trip me. Everything out there, everything sharp wants to cut me, right? It's just work is inherently dangerous. And if you listen to the voice of those who do the works, work, the voice of the workers, they're helping us build better defenses. And we're focusing more on those significant, you know, some people call them SEFs or PSEFs, right? Serious mm -hmm. injury or fatality. But also, that, you know, one company has that thing sticky. You may have heard of it. Stuff that can kill you. Yes. And then, like Andy, my work partner says, stabby stuff that can bankrupt you is also important because <laughs> we're in the business to make stuff to make money, right? So some of this stuff is not just safety related; it's it's operational related. So yeah, I think there's a change happening, and it's for the good. But I think there's so much to do; it feels overwhelming sometimes. But we just tackle it one conversation at a time and one problem at a time. And I think the more people, I love the fact that you have a podcast. Um, or what, what would this be called? Video podcast? I mean, it's your, your video and audio. Yep. Um, sharing any of this kind of thinking with more people because uh, that's actually how uh, Andy Schoen from uh, Southpac heard me on a podcast with Todd Conklin years ago. And and, and the, that's how we connect. So you guys have a, a, the ability to reach a lot of people uh, with uh, with some messaging that may help. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Uh, Bob, uh, looking forward to seeing you down in Australia next month. Um, if you do have time and you're in Perth, I know you are in Perth, but if you do have time, uh, you can always hit me up. I'm happy to get shout you a flat white or a cold beer, whatever takes your fancy. Um, but honoured to have you on the show. 
But for now, uh, we'll call it time. And uh, thank you once again. And I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Pleasure, Mike. Thanks for listening to Health and Safety Conversations with Tom Bourne. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your week.